So good evening. We want to get um, right to it. What God has given us on tonight. And tonight I want to talk a little bit about the promises of God. And we are in a, a unprecedented uh, time uh, right now with pandemics and, and all type of tensions and issues going on. I was telling my wife, you know, just when um, you think this thing might be getting ready to let up, I read something where uh, the, the Dr. Fauci or the, the, the head doctor, <laughs> he said, start wearing two masks. <laughs> You can't hardly get some people to wear one mask. Now he said, wear two masks, double, double masks. You can't breathe in one. I said, God, help, God don't help us. We are in times that, that we have never been in before. But I don't know about you. I'm going to continue to stand on the promises of God. God has made promises to his people in his written word. God continually makes promises to his people through his prophets, through his preachers, his teachers, his pastors. He makes promises to his people. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, understanding um, the promises of God. The promises of God come with a, a date. Um, we, we look at things in, in our calendar and we just uh, were blessed to learn more about uh, the, the timing of God, the kairos, the, the time of God. We, we learned about that and understand, understood a little bit more about that now than we did before. But the blessed, the promises of God come with the time. Uh, the time is not always what we consider uh, our time, as in January, February, March, uh, a seasonal calendar time. The time of God is not always marked by our our calendar. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, the, the promise, because when God speaks, God speaks with eternity in mind. Because when God says something will happen, it does not always mean it's going to happen tomorrow. But just because it has not happened yet, still does not negate the promise of God. Mm, 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 mm. He, he, he said, he, he said, he, he, he makes promises, but his promises are not set by our calendar. I'm going to start with the familiarity of scripture. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. We probably don't, don't even need to turn to it. We know it. But to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So even the promises God makes still have a season Oh my God, this, this is about to gonna bless somebody. And they have a purpose. God does not waste his breath <laughs> just saying things. God, God doesn't just run off at the mouth. Well, when God speaks, there is a purpose behind what he says. When you look through the Bible, every time God spoke, there was a purpose behind it. It says to everything, it has a time and a purpose. You may not understand the purpose. You may not understand why it hasn't happened yet, but you can trust and believe it has a purpose to what God said. So let me start with, with elementary. What is a promise? A promise is a, Webster's Dictionary describes a promise as a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen. I love that, a declaration or an assurance 
that one will do a particular thing. That, that's what a promise is. It's a declaration or it's an assurance. God makes a promise. Because here's the reason why God has to make a promise. Because God makes a promise to assure us, declaration or an assurance, that he has not forgot about you, nor has he forsaken you. <laughs> so I have to make a declaration or an assurance so you won't think that I forgot about you. Oh, my goodness. How many times do we have to make a promise to somebody because they thought we forgot to do something? Mm -hmm. My 13-year-old, my I, sometimes I got to promise her that her allowance is coming. <laughs> Where's my allowance? I'll give it to you. I promise. I got to promise my oldest in college that the money is coming. You have to make a promise to assure someone that a particular thing will be done. So, so the, the question would be, if someone asks, why does God have to make a promise? God is not a man that he should lie, Numbers 23 and 19, neither the son of man that he should repent Hath he said, and shall he not do it? In other words, the Numbers 23 and 19 is declaring that if God said it, he will do it. Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God is not a man that he should lie. Why is that relevant? Because, uh, uh, let's just be honest, sometimes men lie. <laughs> See, sometimes a man will, a man, a woman will lie to you to get you to do something they want you to do. They, they, they lie to influence you to get you to do something. I mean, uh, I, I shouldn't even have to go all the way there, but, but you know, some of the single women, <laughs> when you were single, uh, you, you probably could attest that the, what I'm talking about, a man might lie to you. To get you to do something. See, but he, what, what the scripture is teaching is God is not a man that he should lie. He does not have to lie to you about his promises to get you to serve him, to get you to worship him. He, he doesn't have to lie to you. He, he's, not, he's not a man. When he makes a promise, because sometimes, here, here's the thing, sometimes we'll make a promise and it turns into a lie simply because we can't fulfill what we promise. Oh, my God, that, that's a good one. Uh, it, it wasn't even a lie when you said it, but, 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 but now it's time to come through with the promise. You cannot fulfill it, so it becomes a lie. Uh, I promised you I'd give you some money, but now I don't have it. I promised you I would do this, but now I have to do something else. And it turns into a lie, even though that wasn't the intention, because you cannot fulfill it. But what this verse is teaching is God is not a man. There is no situation, no circumstance that can prevent God from doing what he said he will do so he can give you a promise because there is no way it will not come to pass. The word of God says to Im immutable things, God cannot lie. Oh my God. Oh my God, I didn't want to go there. He can't lie. He can't, he can't lie. Why can't he lie? Because what he says comes to pass. Oh my God. Even if that wasn't the situation. Oh my God, my God, my God. He, he, he can't lie. He can't lie. He, because he's all powerful. Whatever he declares has to come into line. Oh, I, 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 I hear my mind just going right, right to the disciples in the, in the uh, boat uh, uh, when, when Jesus commanded the wind and the waves to stop that they couldn't understand. I, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? It's simply because he commanded them and they had, my God, had to come into agreement with what he says. 
So why? Why why does he make a promise? He makes a promise to assure us. The promise is to assure us that he hadn't forgot about us. To assure us that, that he will do what he said he will. To assure us that there's going to be situations and circumstances that we that we feel like God has left us, that we feel like God has forsaken us, that might make us feel like God doesn't care about us, but all you have to do is look back at the promise. Mm, 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 mm. I, I look I, I look at the promise. But but what I want to help tonight is I, I, I want to come out of this teaching helping someone understand a little more about the promises of God. Look at Matthew 6 and 31. I'm going hit, to hit you with some familiar ones. But I want to bring some, un, some greater understanding to them. 6 and 31 says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? 32, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Uh, what he's saying is, I don't want you spending all your time thinking about, worrying about these things. See, that there's one thing to, to move in a di direction. You know, yes, we understand. We have to have a job. We, we need a place to live. We need clothes to wear. But, but there's, a di there's a difference in acquiring those things and worrying about those things. See, it, it's no big deal. Paying your bills when you got money in, in your pocket. When you got money in the bank, you're not worried about paying your bills when you have money. When you don't have money, you worry about your bills. He, he said, I, I never wanted your life to be filled with being stressed out, worried about the things that you don't have. 32 says, for your heavenly father knoweth ye have need of these things. 33 says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. That, that, that is a promise. That is a promise. But, but here, here's the thing that a lot of church people miss. Is to every promise, there's a requirement. To every promise, there's a prerequisite to the promise. A God is a contractual God. The, the contract becomes, if you do, I will do. You do your part, God will do his part. The reason why he makes you a promise is because he's asking you to do your part first. If he did his part first, why would he need to make a promise? The, the promise comes in to assure you that if you do your part, God is... My God, promising you, promising you, declaring to you that he will do his part. So what's, what's that look like? What's that look like? You could break this down to the simplest of terms. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. He said, in other words, put me first. Put me first. If you put me first. Well, watch this. You can say it like this. If you take care of my house, I'll take care of your house. If you put me first, I'll put you first. If you make me your priority, I'll make you my priority. Oh, my God. See, seek ye first. Ye first, ye first. I can take you to, to First Chronicles where it talks about Obed-Edom, where he housed the ark of God in his house. And because he took care of God's house, God took care of his house. The reason why, I know the reason why God gave me this is because there's some people that feels like God is not taking care of their house. So the question becomes, are you taking care of God's house? 
See, I'm trying to come against. I'm, I'm trying to dispel the myths that people talk about when, when they say, this ain't working for me. I don't understand why I'm not getting blessed. I don't understand why I hear about, read about these promises. People testify about these things coming to pass, but I don't see it coming to pass in my life. The question becomes, are you fulfilling the prerequisite? Oh, there's something about when you take care of God's house. There's something about when you put God's house first. He promised you he would take care of your house. Obed, you know, Obed Edom and the Lord blessed the house of Obed B. Edom and all that he had. All, everything that fell under his roof, everything that he was commissioned to, he was, he was assigned, he was working on. God took care of everything that he had because he took care of God's house first. Promises, promises, promises. I know it looks like uh, it's not going to come to pass. I, I know it looks like uh, uh, you, you don't understand why, why it's not working for you. I, that, that's the first thing I want to make sure we understand is, is are you hitting the prerequisites? The prerequisites to, to the promise. You want God to take care of your house. Will you take care of his house? We can find ourselves getting trapped uh, uh, in the mind state, in the thinking of, of the promises of God are only about how am I going to get blessed? Uh, what, you know, what, 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 what's in it for me? You know, you know, we, we don't look at, at, the, at the promises of God just at that way because there's promises in the Bible also about the judgment of God, about the wrath of God. What I'm just teaching here tonight is, is I want to make sure we understand the prerequisites to every promise. We understand that he's a contractual God. So many people... Uh, get happy and excited about getting blessed and having nice things. And there's nothing wrong with that. God does not have a problem with you having things. God's problem is when things have you. God's problem is when you worship things ahead of him. When you worship the creation more than the creator. He never has a problem with you having things. You can go through the Bible and look at all the times that God gave people things. God has no problem giving you things. It's just what will you do with what God what God gave you? But we get excited. We get excited. We get excited about, about the blessing promises. But wait, here's a promise right here that, that I want to make sure people get. Uh, Psalms 34 and 19. Here's a promise. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. <laughs> here's a promise. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. That means afflictions are coming to you if, if you're righteous. I like to say it like this. The, the more righteous you try to live, the more afflictions are coming your way. Many, many, not, not one, not two, but many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's why sometimes I don't understand why some people get so surprised and confused and can't understand when they're attacked and, and villainized and have enemies and, and people running your name down. It's not just stabbing you in the back, but stabbing you in the front. He said many are the afflictions of the righteous. He told you, he warned you, he gave, he gave this instruction ahead of time so you could expect it. That many afflictions are coming. Oh, but there's a there's a B clause to this. <laughs> so I don't get surprised. I don't get confused. I don't stop praising. I don't stop worshiping. I don't turn my back on God because I knew this is coming. But the B clause is, but the Lord. Any time there is a but, whoo, my God. A uh, but represents that, that what's coming after that is going to be different than what preceded it. Oh, my God. But, but the Lord, but 
the Lord. I understand it's coming. I understand the attacks. I understand there's enemies. I understand there's haters. But the Lord delivered him out of, the, of, of one of them, two of them, three of them, some of them. No. He said them all delivers him out of them all. So when it comes your way, uh, we can't say there was no warning. But when it comes your way, uh, that's why we shouldn't get confused and worried and, 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 and stop going to, to our, our churches and, and stop praising and, and stop sowing. Uh, the warning was already there, but God gave you a promise. Watch this. God never promises the obvious. Oh, did, did that help somebody? God never promises the obvious. Well, what's that mean, Pastor Tim? Uh, there's no, you don't have to put a promise on something that's already obviously there. It, when, when I wake up in the morning, if I tell my wife that the sun is shining outside, I, I don't have to make a promise about that. Because, you know, it's pretty obvious that the sun is going to rise in the morning. It, it, it's nighttime now. If I tell her it's dark, I don't have to promise that it's dark outside because that's pretty obvious that it's going to be dark at night. See, God never promises the obvious. God has, a make, has to make a promise when something's not obvious to you. God has to come in and make a promise when, it, when you're going through all types of hell, when it looks like God has forsaken you, when it looks like God doesn't care about you. I don't have to promise you the obvious thing. I got to come in and make a promise to encourage you. I got to come in and make a declaration to lift you up. I, I don't promise the obvious thing. I got to make a promise when it's not obvious that I'm there. Why do you think, Paul penned it, for we walk by faith and not by sight? Because if you look at what you're going through, it's going to look like you're not going to make it. It might look like you won't succeed. It might look like you're going to go broke. It might look like you'll end up homeless. You might end up carless. It might look like you're not going to make it. It might even look like you're not going to be saved. It might look like you can't live holy. He said, don't go by what you see. He said, we walk by faith and not by sight. If you just keep looking at the situation, you'll give up. You'll quit. You'll throw in the towel if you just go by what you see. But he had to come in and give a promise. Yeah, if, I, if I went by what I saw, I would have gave up a long time ago. If I, if I just looking at the situation, I would have quit. I was just looking at the situation. I would have said, I don't see God working in my life. I don't see God moving in this. If I just looked at it, if I just looked at how could this happen? How could this happen to me? If I'm looking at the situation, how can I go through this if God really loves me? How can I go through that if God really, I'm, I'm look, because I'm looking, if I'm just looking at the situation, oh my God, but I'm not walking by faith. I'm walking by what I see. Look in your Bible. Look at all the situations that the apostles, the disciples, the prophets, the men and women of God went through if they had just looked at their situation. All right, God. So, so that's why we walk by faith. Because to every circumstance we get into, there's a promise there's a promise that God will get you out of it. There's a, there's a promise. He, he said, you could made it any simpler than this. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If I don't leave you or forsake you, 
That means I have to get you out of whatever the enemy's got you in. Some things even you got yourself in. But when we repent and get it right with God and move to where he wants us to go, he's faithful to forgive. So now I got to come and get you because you can't fulfill your destiny stuck in that. I can't leave you there because you can't fulfill your destiny. I can't forsake you because you can't fulfill your destiny. He said, I never, I never leave thee nor forsake thee. He made, he made us promises. He, he made us promises, promises to, 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 to assure us, to assure us as we go through this walk that, that we will make it. That we will come out on the other side. He made us promises. He made us assurances. But there's, there's prerequisites to every promise. Here's one that I love. I got to teach it. Isaiah 54 17 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Here's what I love about this. No means no. Oh, ah, ah. No weapon. No weapon. No means no. I love Bishop Lewis said it like this. Even if one weapon were to prosper. Oh my God. Look at the power of that. Even if one weapon were to prosper. It would make God's word of no effect. Not even one is going to prosper against you. Not, not one, not one. I love it. No means no. Shall not, shall not be able to prosper against you. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. Now, th that's a promise. That's a promise from God. And we can tap into that. We can tap into that promise. And I will teach this while I'm here. Just because you see it form. But does not mean it's prospering because I can hear somebody in the spirit right now oh, hearing this saying, well, I've seen some weapons uh, form. I've seen some people do some things. I've seen uh, some situations. I've seen my enemies gathering against me. I, I may have got a, a termination letter. I may have gotten laid off. I may have lost my home. Uh, it may look like there's a weapon that's prospering against you. I'm here to tell you that he never said it would not form. He just said it wouldn't prosper. I love to teach it like this. Just because you see it forming, it does not mean it's working for you. You've got to check and see if God's using it to work. Does It does not mean it's working against you. You've got to check and see to make sure that God is not using it to work for you. Oh, I've seen, I've seen plenty of weapons work for somebody. Oh, that, that's why it got as far as it got. That, that's why it formed the way it formed. Because at some point, God flipped it and kept it from working against you and made it work for you. Why, why do you think he said what the enemy meant for evil? It could have started out meant for evil. It, it could have started out to destroy you. But there's times where God will take that thing and flip it. And the very thing that was meant to destroy you is the thing God uses to promote you, that God uses to propel you, that God uses to bless you. Oh my God. I, I just get so full of the words sometimes. I don't like the, the jump like, uh, accounts. I, I mean, just, just in my mind, God just showed me just uh, this a story of Esther and when Haman built the gallows to hang all the children of Israel on. And God flipped that thing and the same gallows he built to hang them on, he hung on himself. That there's some weapons that some people are, are building to take you out and they're going to hang on them themselves. I can testify to plenty of things that's happened in my life. Somebody, when I was at my job, someone tried to get me fired for something I didn't do. 
And the same thing they tried to get me fired for, they got fired. Touch not mine anointed. That that scripture is not just for a pastor or a bishop. If you if you have the Holy Spirit, you are His anointed. But but here's the thing. Here's the thing. I want to I want to make sure I teach from this Isaiah fifty four and seventeen. That, that it's a promise. No weapon. No weapon that's formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. But watch this. The prerequisite of this promise is this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. What becomes becomes of this promise is to tap into this promise is this is the heritage of the servant of the Lord. So if, if anybody can truly say some weapons were formed and they prospered against them, this, this becomes a self-examination. You have to ask yourself, are you a servant of the Lord? This, 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 this type of promise, this type of protection is only for the servant of the Lord. It becomes his heritage, his, her heritage. Heritage, it, it becomes mine, even though I don't have it yet. It's going to be willed to me. It's something that runs in the family. It runs in my bloodline. Oh, just just not, not succumbing to a weapon is part of my DNA. If I'm a servant of the Lord, it becomes my heritage. It's just something that's already prepared and laid up for me already in advance. Are you a servant of the Lord? And their righteousness is of me. So you you tap into this promise through servanthood. I'm just just trying to help. Just just trying to help Uh, anybody who who just is honest enough to to say to themselves, I just felt like I'm not catching some of these promises. I'm not getting some of these promises. Don't let the enemy make you think that it's because God doesn't love you, that you're not good enough, that, that you're not part of the clique, part of the club. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. But if you don't understand the prerequisite, you may just not qualify for the promise. Not because of who you are, just because you may not have understood how it works. It is the heritage, the heritage of the servant of the Lord. See, and it becomes not my job, not anybody else's job to say who's a servant. That's why I cannot sit here and say who it is and who it isn't, because God knows who's the servant. God knows who, who who has kept up with his statutes and his commandments. Second Timothy 2 and 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his. It, it didn't say, I know who's his. It says, the Lord knows who's his. See, this is where you tap into your personal relationship with God, where it becomes not religion, but relationship. But my, I, I don't just go to church out of habit, out of tradition. I don't even read out of habit, tradition. I have a relationship with God where I tap in. That's how I understand the promises where I know I'm in God and I know that God is in me. The Lord knoweth them that are his. God knows. God knows. God knows who qualifies for the, for the promises. God knows who's hit the prerequisites. I don't know, but God knows. That's why we have to be very careful. I, I got a side note. I got a side note here. We, we have to be careful about who we say who is and isn't God's. We have to be careful about, about counting God's people and counting who's in and who's out because it's not all put like this everybody may not pass your eye test but at the end of the day that's why it's really not up to us the the bible says the lord knows 
those who are his. Does that mean God knows? Because some people that we think are in are, are really out. <laughs> and some people we might count out are in. Let me give you Bible for it. Genesis 15 and 6, we got to be careful. It says, and he believed Abraham. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Well, why are you going here, Pastor Tim? This is why we can't always judge and see who, who, who we think is in. Because he said, Abraham, he counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God so much, I'm just going to count you right. See, here's the thing. You might know what somebody did, but you don't know what somebody believes. He, he said, Abraham, I, I'm go you believe me so much. See, see we, we, watch this. Because of the Bible, we know what Abraham did. We, we know that Abraham lied about his wife being his sister. We know that Abraham didn't do exactly what God said and took his nephew Lot with him and got messed up in that mess with the servants fighting. We know that Abraham did things that were not right. We know that Abraham doubted for a moment there that he would have a child with his wife. We know what Abraham did, but we, we don't understand what Abraham believed. See, see, that's what happens in our lives now. You might know what somebody did, but you don't know what they believe. He, he said, I took the belief and I wiped the mistakes out. Woo, my God, I wiped the mistakes out and counted him right just because he believed. So many times we look at what people have done. Woo, my God. See, you might know what I did, but God knows what I will do. We look at what people have done. You, you could go down the line. If you knew me, you knew me in the past, <coughs> you could have recited like a book all the things that I did, all the things I did wrong. You, you could talk about them and bring them up and make fun and point fingers because you know what I did, but only God knows what I will do. <laughs> you can't talk about nothing but what I did. Oh, my God. But but God has. Because when God makes a promise, God speaks with eternity in mind. He said, I I'm not worried about your past. You made a mistake in the past. You did things wrong in the past. But the question becomes, what do you believe now? He said, say it like this. That's why, that's why, that's why my history does not always dictate my destiny. That there are times where there's things from your past that dictate where you're going. That Usually that works out when God's going to use something from your past to propel you to your destiny, that happens. But watch this, there's sometimes, when there's things in your past that have absolutely, positively, nothing to do with your destiny. Because if people judged you by your history, oh my God, you would never make it to the destiny that God has for you. In my destiny, it has absolutely nothing to do with my history. Why do you think Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind I'm ready to run. Forget those things that are behind me, because those things have absolutely nothing to do with my destiny destiny, forget about those mistakes, those sins, those bad habits, I forget about that, it has nothing to do with my destiny, so all you can talk about is what I did, but God's busy telling me about what I'm going to do, Woo! my God, that's why we can't count, we can't count, God speak. 
we, we can't number God's people. Because you don't know who's God, who God is going to use that he may have never used before. That he's raising up based upon what they believe. God, it was accounted unto him as righteousness because what he believed. He just believed God. Watch this. Why he says? Because there's some people that will believe God and haven't even spent as much time in church as some of us. But they'll believe God for what he says when some 10 and 20 and 30 year Christians won't believe God. Sometimes God said, I got to raise up somebody that's going to believe me. Oh my God. Oh my God. It, it, he's looking for somebody that's going to believe him. He's looking for somebody that's going to believe his promises. I, 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 got, I got stuck on Abraham. When you look at Abraham's life, Abraham's whole life was about believing whatever God told him. <laughs> it, it, it's some folks that, that say, sanctify, filled with the Holy Spirit, but still don't believe what God says. They still won't do things that God tells them to do just simply based on what he said, simply based upon the promise that he made. So I raise up somebody that doesn't have the pedigree as you, that doesn't have the background as you. You think they don't qualify, but I'm pre-qualifying them just because they believe. My God, my God, my God. The Lord knows those that are his. The prerequisites. The prerequisites of God. But there's promises that we can tap into. That we can cash in on. But we have to hit the prerequisites. Do you understand? The whole promise is the system is based upon you believing God first. It, 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 God knows that he'll keep up his part. That's why we have to do our part first. Look at Luke 6 and 38. Here's a good one. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Whew, my God. And running over shall men give into your bosom. He said it's going to be good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Powerful, powerful promise. Many preachers use it because it's true. It's accurate. It, 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 it depicts what God wants to do in our lives. And many of us get excited, and we can just imagine God doing this, and we can imagine... Uh, receiving these types of blessings. But here's, here's what I love to give people on this one. The prerequisite to this, and this is the reason why many people never see this happen in their life, is because he had one simple prerequisite to this. It's the first word of this. I, I usually don't ask people to type in, but can somebody just type in what's the first word of this verse? Of Luke 6 and 38. This is why it is not coming good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. This is the reason why some people have never seen this, and some people may never see this, is because to get this, the first thing is you got to give. So for all the people who say, I, I never seen it pressed down, shaking together, and running over, shall men give in your bosom. Somebody might even say, <clears throat> ain't nobody ever gave me nothing. Ain't no men, men ain't never gave me nothing. Nobody's ever gave in to me. No, uh, have you 
get the prerequisite? The first part of this promise is to give. The first part of seeing this happen, of seeing this manifestation is to give. Because it was never about you having so much and pockets being on swole and living large. That wasn't even that wasn't even the part of the promise. The part of the promise was all based upon everything going in a cycle. Ah. God. It was a cycle of you giving, of you helping, of you sowing, of you being a conduit for God to flow into the earth to show the unbeliever that the people of God are loving, giving people whose nature has been changed by God so that we are able to give, take care of, support, help. Because we have an expectation of God giving it back to us. It was never about how much you could have. It was about, watch this, it's because you are, I am a limited resource. And if I only give and I never receive, then I run out and I have no more to give. So then it becomes the promise of God that says, if I give, he now promised me he would give it back to me. Why? So I would have some more to give. So that I would never run out and there will be a constant flow. Whew. Oh, Because the reason why I have to keep giving it to you so you will always have something so that I will bless your house until you have so much overflow, you have something to always give to somebody else. Back it up with scripture, Pastor Tim. Acts chapter 20 and 35 says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is what he's teaching. This is what Jesus was teaching. The greater blessing goes to the giver than to the receiver. So many people have missed this, have missed this over the years. That they thought or misunderstood that getting something was, was the greater blessing, was receiving. But the greater blessing comes to the one that gives. The one that gives gets the greater blessing. If you're only going to receive, if I didn't do nothing but receive, I should never expect it to be pressed down, shaken together, and running over if all I've ever done is receive. But once I give, whew, my God, once I give, I now tap into the promise where it becomes more of a blessing. More of a blessing comes upon me for giving than receiving. I, I tap into, I tap into the promise. The promises that God makes, he swore by. So in this day, in this day and age, you, you know, we don't swear. We're not supposed to swear. Uh, Bible even teaches us about swearing. But but at the time this was written, I, I, I was teaching, I believe it was last week, where I love how now that I, I, I'm, I'm studying at a different level to where I'm constantly trying to put myself in the timeline of when it was written and, and get a deeper understanding based upon when it was written and bring it back into the time now. So in that time, <clears throat> we don't swear, but in that time, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they swore that the swearing what was a, 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 a way of, of legitimizing the, the, the deal or the promise or, or, or the contract they were making between two people. It was, I, I, I said I'm going to do this and my guarantee is I'm going to swear that I'm doing it. I swear that I'll give it to you. I swear that it, it was their way of authenticating the deal. You go back in the Old Testament and you'll hear all, you read all types of, of ways of when someone swore that they would do it. So God said it's because that's what they're doing. Huh. 
<laughs> he said, when I make this promise in this dispensation, he said, that, and when they would swear, they would always swear by something that was greater. They would swear by something greater than what they were making the agreement about. Mm, mm, that's going to bless somebody. They, they swore by something greater. So he says, if I'm going to give you this, and my swear to you is if I don't fulfill this, now I have to give you more than what I said I'd give you. I'm swearing by something greater, swearing by my, my family, my, my riches, whatever, my cattle, whatever I have. If I don't fulfill this, I'll give you that. I'm swearing by something greater. So he said, because... This is the way that men did it, so that my servant will understand how serious I am. Whew, my God. He, he said, when I make this promise, I'm going to swear by something. The Hebrews 6 and 13. So, so when God told Abraham he would bless him. He would make him a father of nations. He will set him up. His seed will be as the sand of the sea. He said, I'm going to swear by something. So when God looked around to find something greater, ah, God, he said, I got to find something greater so that I can swear by and make this oath a binding contract. He looked around to find something greater than himself. But because he couldn't find nothing greater than himself, he said, I swear by myself. I know some people have made promises to you. I know some people have let you down. But he said, I swear by myself because he could not find anybody any greater. Woo. My God. So what I'm saying is, what I want you to get is your promises. The promises God has made are guaranteed and are backed by God. <laughs> Who would you rather have your promise backed by? Your promise guaranteed by, by, by the one who can do anything in any situation, any circumstance. When God makes you a promise, whew, my God, when God makes, and I'm not limited to it, not limited it just to the Bible. There's some promises God has made to you personally. There's some promises God has made in your prayer time. Some promises in your worship time. There's promises God has made to you about your family, about your children, about your marriage, about your business. Hold on to those promises. My God, here you go. Because God says a promise is a promise. When it comes to him. A promise is a promise. My God, my God, my God. I know, I know you've seen some things that look like it ain't going to happen. I know you've seen some things that look like you don't understand where this came from, how this got here. Uh, you can't figure out uh, uh, where is God, uh, uh, you know, what God told you. But I'm here tonight to tell you to hold on to the promise that God gave you. Hold on to what God told you. Hold on to what God showed you. Hold on to the promises that God has made. Ooh, my God, my God, my God. I can't even go there. Every time I, I read about, I'm out of time. Every time I read about the promises that God made to Abraham, <laughs> that he was going to keep, even after Abraham died, God keeps promises to, to dead people. Ooh. Oh, my God, my God, my God. Just because it doesn't happen today doesn't mean God's not going to keep his promise. Remember, God speaks 
with eternity in mind. God speaks. God speaks to the end of a thing. The end of a thing. It, it, it does not mean it's not true because it hadn't happened yet. It does not mean God does not have the power. It doesn't mean it. But we go back to where we started. To everything there is a season. And a time to every purpose under the heaven. So I go back to God. And I find out now this becomes one-on-one -on -one relationship. I go back to God and I find out. Am I holding up the prerequisites of the promise? I go back to God asking him about the timing. Am I doing something to delay? Remember, this is relationship. It's not just religion. It's relationship. So now I go back to the promise keeper. And I talk to him. <clears throat> God, what do I need to do? Is there something I need to do different? Am I just to keep waiting on you? Do you need me to get in order? There's many times, there's some times that we're waiting on God. God is waiting on us. That is our time for today. I pray that something was said to encourage you, to help you.